So I'm joined by Yuri Dagan. Yuri, you've been on Rebel Wisdom before, talking about the lab leak hypothesis. Welcome back. Thanks. So I'm going to do a, explain a little bit, a little bit of backstory about why we're talking now. I'm sure a lot of people who are watching this will be aware of this backstory. Many probably won't as well. Uh, so your background, you were one of the main researchers in the Drastic Collective that did a lot to uncover some of the evidence around the lab leak hypothesis. And you were on Brett Weinstein's podcast uh, quite a while ago. You've been on Rebel Wisdom more recently. But then you also co-wrote a piece in Quillette with Claire Belinsky that was very critical of Brett's perspective on vaccines and ivermectin. And there have also been criticisms of that piece, which we'll get into in a second as well. So the reason that we're having this talk today is not just to criticize Brett. Rebel Wisdom has done events together with Brett and Heather in 2018. Um, I consider him a friend. Uh, I consider what he's doing uh, and has been doing over, over the years really, really valuable. But I also share some of the concerns and also, I think it's not, it's not just about Brett and it's not just about the dark horse. These are clearly hugely important topics. It's, it's some of the most important topics, some of the most important uh, issues that are going on at the moment. It shows some of the problems with how we understand the world, with making sense of the world, but also these are incredibly consequential claims. So getting to the bottom of them is really, really important. And I don't think there's any other way to get to the bottom of them other than to hear all sides of the story. And my huge concern at the moment is that I don't think, I think the way that the, the way that the platforms we're using work, the way that the information ecology works is that we're all in these little silos of information where what is considered true in one bubble is considered obviously false in the other and vice versa. And I think my big concern, and I've said this to Brett privately, is that he it seems to only be having conversations with people who he agrees with, and he's not challenging them, and he's not having a dialogue with people who disagree with his reading on the data. And that, for me, is a real problem, uh, because I, I don't see how you come to truth if you're not actually challenging the people that you're having conversations with, and you're not challenging your own thinking on this. So this is my primary concern. And I know that there will be comments below this. We've got a huge overlap with Brett's audience. There'll be comments below this saying, oh, why aren't you talking to Steve Kirsch? Why aren't you talking to Robert Malone? Why aren't you talking to Pierre Corey? One thing I'll say now is I have reached out to all of those people and invited them to come on. My ideal would be to host debates and dialogues between them and their critics. So far, I've had no luck in that. I, they haven't responded. And that has... That's what I would like to do going forward, but that has not happened so far. So I know that Brett and Heather have responded to your Quillette piece on their own podcast. You have talked about it on some podcasts with a very low um, view count. So I think that the... It's the, not the, nice. The necessary, <laughs> well, it's, it's true, is it not? It's true, but I mean, who a, cares a, a what's the view count? Okay. Yeah. So... And, and we've been in contact. I think you have, like, when I talk to you, I think you, you make valid points. I think there have been criticisms of the Quillette article and the way that you expressed yourself that I agree with. I contacted you soon after that article came out, and maybe we'll start here. I contacted you soon after that article came out, and I said that whatever you were trying to do, whoever you were trying to reach, I thought that was a real tactical error by you and Claire Belinsky to have such loaded language in the Quillette piece. You used phrases like, um, talking of Brett, his promotion of outright quackery during a pandemic that has killed more Americans than any catastrophe since the Civil War is immoral. And I thought that was a very short-sighted thing to do because that kind of language, framing it in terms of shaming and morality and those kind of topics, and that kind of language I thought would be likely to turn off anyone that you might reach because for uh, for a good reason i think people are well aware and suspicious of anything that looks like bad faith or anything looks like loaded language or emotional language um 
So it's the bad faith, man. Like, <laughs> so yeah. What? How do you respond? How do you respond to that, Yuri? First of all, I think people don't understand what bad bad faith means when they use this term. Because I mean, legally, bad faith implies that you have some ulterior motive of doing something, and you're actually faking whatever you're. The reason you're saying you're doing it has, like, if I was doing this calling Brad Hour using whatever the language to, I don't know, get views or fame or, I don't know, being paid by Pfizer to do this. That would be bad, bad faith. I'm not. I don't care about views. I don't care about followers. I don't have a Patreon. I don't, I don't even, to be honest, I'm wasting way too much time on the Twitter and doing all these podcasts. So, uh, but coming, it's, yeah. So bad faith is like the, the least, I think applicable applicable uh, characterization of our uh, you know motives for the Quillette article with Claire. Uh, now regarding tone and regarding it maybe being a little bit over the top, being maybe too confrontational. Uh, in hindsight, probably a valid criticism, but we just didn't expect that people would be so concerned about the tone that they would be like completely blinded to the actual content, to the message. And it, this has been actually funny because so many people say like, your article is complete garbage. It, it, it completely misrepresents the Brett's position and it's got so many errors. And then we're like, okay, could you point out the errors? And in response, there's nothing. Cause people when they actually like uh, take off the blinders, emotional blinders and try to analyze the content, there's there's really no errors in the article other than, the, I don't know, the littlest thing, like Marinos, like he's pointing out like, oh, there's 99%, but there's 100%. And he said, like, he's, uh, anyway, the, the littlest things that have really no bearing on the correctness of the article, uh, basically nitpicking to, I don't know, it's like comas or something. Um, so basically the question was why like was there did i understand correctly that your question was why did we choose to do this why did we choose to write the article or why yes, did we choose to write to it call in out, a way that and also to call out brett publicly well why, i mean brett is the biggest you... source of this misinformation he's the biggest voice basically he is the the the, the leader of the movement for ivermectin false efficacy and vaccine false dangers like Brett is the spokesperson for the movement. So, uh, and he's also a friend, or at least I, I still consider him a friend. Maybe he no longer thinks of me as a friend. And maybe there's a bit of a disconnect between like what people in Russia, <laughs> the level of shit they can tell their friends and still remain friends. And I don't know, people in the United States that they, they can't, like there may be, so thin-skinned or the, to them, like criticism or even vocal criticism or even like being a little bit of a jerk when voicing criticism to them, that's the deal breaker and friendship's over. I don't know. In Russia, we like, we fight first, then we drink vodka and then everything's fine. Uh, but Brett said he's thick-skinned and he didn't mind the tone and I apologized. I mean, I did apologize. I kind of, because Eric called me out i guess on the tone and said like come on there, there was no need to use that kind of tone with brad eric joined this clubhouse conversation a few days ago so i kind of felt bad and i apologize for the tone like if you know if i didn't mean it to be hurtful although the, i mean i stand by the content i stand by the outright quakery is it quakery quackery i mean whatever i stand by the i i, I mean i think it's immoral it's not an insult. I think, you know, it's, it's, I don't mean it to be an insult. I don't think Claire meant it to be an insult. It's, it's, I think to us, it's a statement of what is going on, which is like, if there is this unproven uh, therapy or unproven accusations of dangers of vaccines in a pandemic without fully having established consensus on this too and actually going against the prevalent consensus going against the consensus of science going against the consensus of cdc is immoral like you're you're gonna kill people people who believe trust you and they, they've been kind of captured by you feeding them this distrust of institutions now this distrust of institutions turning into their distrust of vaccines 
and offering an alternative, like take ivermectin, don't take vaccines. If you, if people, even though you might not be like exactly saying, people are like that's not what exactly Brad is saying, but this is ultimately the the, the message. Sure, but so, Yuri, that's a that's a logical fallacy to say that not trusting the consensus is immoral because you like you know with on, the lab leak on hypothesis, this particular no in, like, well you know that with the lab leak hypothesis the consensus was wrong and was badly wrong so surely saying but, you know we believing or not believing the lab leak hypothesis is, won't is kill you it's not going to huh? kill you i don't care like if it was about the lab leak hypothesis i wouldn't even say anything if it was about like i don't know telomeres and, and mice and drug safety i i didn't say anything but this concerns life and death stuff and there is scientific consensus not like just five virologists who have conflict of interest to suppress lab leak hypothesis, as it was in that case. This is like thousands of doctors, medical professionals, drug developers who have zero conflict of interest. They're not paid off by big pharma, but they're speaking out for vaccines. They're saying like, if you think vaccines are dangerous or at least more dangerous than catching COVID, you're out of your mind. And propagating the message, the the converse of this message to your millions of viewers, I think, is immoral because it's a life and death thing. It's not just abstract, like, did, I don't know, other UFOs out there or did 9-11 was, I don't know, an inside job. You know, do that. That's, that's like totally fine. I don't care about like things that are not going to kill people who believe or don't believe in stupid things. But if you believe in stupid things that vaccines are dangerous and ivermectin is going to prevent you from catching COVID, that is immoral to propagate because that's going to kill people. Um, mm. So, I mean, that's, that's really, and it's, again, I think we, we discussed it privately that it's not like we just blindsided Brett and released this Colette piece without, you know, first trying to talk sense into him because this has been actually behind the scenes going on for at least two, if not three months, at least from my side, as soon as Brett put out this podcast with Gert Vandenbosch promoting this quackery of, uh, you know, vaccines are dangerous, they're going to create escape variants, and your natural antibodies are going to be inhibited by antibodies from vaccines. Like, to me, that was like, whoa, Brett, dude, like, this is bullshit. Why are you promoting this? This was even before Evermectin. This was before exploding ovaries. So, I, I mean, I challenged him on that, and he was, I mean, he didn't really choose to engage in, in a conversation and then he put out other podcasts and again i first i think very politely you know ask him about like what's your evidence for 100 percent efficacy of ivermectin or like look this graph that you're showing with ovaries being the highest organ with the highest concentration is misleading because there's four other places with much higher concentration shouldn't you like correct for this and you know he didn't even acknowledge this this uh, problem and then I reached out privately. I offered to debate these things on his podcast. I offered to bring other people on his podcast. And it just didn't go anywhere. And he just kept kind of doing it and doing it and doing it more loudly. And at some point, uh, well, actually, it was Claire that kind of said, Brett, this is like, would you engage if I write this article publicly with all my criticism of your position and where I think you're wrong? And he's like, OK, yeah, sure, I'll definitely respond. And then this is where I approached Claire. I said, okay, like I actually would like to contribute. I have some, you know, arguments about the podcast, like scientific arguments that if you think there would be, there'd be a place for them in the paper, you know, would be happy to team up. And this is what happened. We wrote a pr pretty big manuscript actually that was a later, like really trimmed down in the Quillette piece that we sent to Brett. We sent before publishing like two weeks in advance. We emailed to Brad the, the, the draft of the manuscript, said, look, these are our arguments. If you feel that, you know, we're somehow misrepre misrepresenting a position or you'd like to kind of retract your, some of your statements up front so that, you know, let's do that. And so we don't have to needlessly uh, kind of call you out on things that maybe you no longer believe. And uh, so he never replied. He just I guess ignored those emails, and we just chose to we chose to publish it. And uh, yeah, in retrospect, maybe like the tone, like the the degree of the uh, rhetoric calling out was a little too much. But again, benefit of hindsight. Unfortunately, we only get that uh, after we do stuff. So maybe like if if I was doing it 
again, I would cho choose to tone it down, but not by much. So you're going to share the evidence and the conclusions and the criticisms that you have. I'm going to try and respond with some of the counter criticisms that have been made, some of the things that Brett and Heather have said. I'm not going to do it perfectly. I'm sure there's much more that they would want to say. I think they're writing a written response to your Quillette article at the moment. So it's yeah. going to be an imperfect process. But the reason for doing it is I think that you, my impression of the, the arguments that you've put forward is that there is a strong signal behind it. So I think it's really worth putting into this ecosystem so people can make up their own mind about the about how convincing the arguments are on either side. Yeah, and like so many people, for some reason, like they ask to have a podcast about it, like debate it live with Brett. And I'm like, well, why? I mean, it's all out there. All of the like, all of the, the claims on all of the data are out there in written form. But I guess some people just, I mean, they, it, for them, it's much easier to watch a YouTube podcast for, I don't know, like an hour than actually have to dig through all of the, all the evidence, which would take them much longer. And they probably don't want to get too deep. They just want to kind of the uh, Cole's note summary that then they can just, you know, uh, for themselves decide, does that sound convincing or does it not sound convincing? They don't need really to make the, the, FDA level assessment of the of the evidence, they just need to say like, okay, this sounds more convincing that probably vaccines are more safe than the, the danger that other people claim, or ivermectin is probably not as efficacious as they claim, and then the, that's the level of interest in the topic that they have. Yeah. So we'll in a second anyway. we'll start going into the detail, but this just to to speak to what you just said, like that's my concern as well is that. It's all with with these kind of claims. It's always the last ten percent. It's where skepticism towards the old towards the mainstream, towards the consensus narrative, then turns into certainty on the other side. And I find that people's skepticism tends to only go so far. They'll be very skeptical of one side, and then very accepting of the other side. And so I'll I'll also say that. Brett and Heather's overall perspective, what was interesting in there, they, they put out the, their response to your Quillette article. I think it was podcast 87. And what was interesting listening to that is that for the first 35 minutes, they made their case. They didn't talk about the Quillette article at all. They, talk, they made their case about there are huge financial and institutional incentives pointing towards not reporting on certain medical, medical issues. Um, there are there's capture of the institutions. There are problems with the incentive structure of the mainstream and the consensus, which I completely agree with. Like I completely agree with their perspective. Um, they read from Ben Goldacre's point about big farm, bad pharma, bad science, and we've put out on Rebel Wisdom some of those criticisms of the mainstream by people like Brett, by people like Eric Weinstein, and I think that's a really good analysis of why a lot of the incentive structures are the same with media. There is groupthink in the media. There are things that can't be reported. Like all of this is true. So I want to kind of grant that at the beginning, but that's not the issue. Like I was quite intrigued by that podcast, the number 87, because the issue is not whether we believe there is inst that institutional capture is possible of different areas. It's whether the truth claims, the specific truth claims that are being made by their guests are true or false. And they are specific truth claims about the spike protein. They are specific truth claims about um, the vaccine safety data. They are specific truth claims about all of these different issues. And my overall concern is that I'm not seeing those claims tested, certainly not on Brett's podcast and certainly not, I don't see anywhere where they're being tested because the problem is you've got the mainstream that will not touch a lot of this, these claims because they don't want to give what they would consider false equivalence between the consensus and the alternative. And then you have the alternative podcasts where there is little incentive for the people hosting them to challenge those claims because you've got a new audience that are really already convinced. And the level of certainty, and this is, this is I'm, so, I'm saying this to the viewer as much as to you, Yuri, the level of certainty that people have around these topics is a huge red flag and is really concerning. It's like 
And I would just ask people, like genuinely kind of inquire, what have you attached a level of certainty to that you, you don't know? You've read certain people, you've projected a certain level of authority onto people like Pierre Corey, like Tess Laurie, like Brett Weinstein, like all of the, like Robert Malone. And, you, and this sort of desire to believe, this want to believe is, is fascinating. And so I would, I would urge people to do a little bit of self-analysis, self-inquiry, and kind of just, just feel into like, what is my desire to believe? What is my attachment to certain narratives? This, there's a compelling narrative on Brett's side of the argument that may have some truth. Like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not equipped to evaluate, but to be aware of the incentive landscape. Let's let's be aware of the incentive landscape on the mainstream, but there's a huge incentive landscape on the other side. There's a compelling narrative of doctors taking on the system. There's a compelling narrative that's fed by the censorship of YouTube, which I think is a huge red flag and a huge error. Like this attempt to censor and shut down the debate is shows like that that system is broken, but that doesn't mean that it's necessarily true. It means that it means that the system is broken. But also, we, we have to avoid getting captured. And we can get captured on both sides by accepting consensus and by rejecting consensus. And that's why sense making is so difficult. Anyway, I wanted to say that for the viewer as much as anything before we go into the, into the analysis of the data. Um, where did you want to, to start? I know you've prepared a, uh, a slide deck to, to go into this. Right. Basically, I just put together the claims, potentially false or unsubstantiated claims in Brett's podcasts or his guests, I mean, claims of his or his guests. Basically, this is a summary of what I've submitted to this better skeptics uh, exercise, I guess. I don't know if you probably can just, you know, give a little background later on what better skeptics is. It's essentially trying to validate or disprove claims, factual claims of Brett or his guests about like vaccine hesitancy or just in general, whatever they said in those podcasts, they could be false. Mm -hmm. the, the Better Skeptics platform is meant to, to either validate or disprove. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've submitted like 20 or up to 30 now claims. And I just uh, put together, I think like 20 most, uh, I think most important or most mm -hmm. egregious claims that I think were should be like highlighted to the viewers. I just want to talk through them because apparently, like to a lot of people, it's hard to first of all, it's hard to like navigate Twitter or that site better skeptics to like try to pull out the exact things, the exact evidence for why those things were false in the podcast. So I just put put it together in like very palatable format that we're just gonna through go through the slides and I'll try to talk through it. And maybe like to a lot of people who are much more like verbal and visual consumers of information rather than, uh, I don't know, readers, uh, maybe that will help them see why exactly I think uh, and <laughs> mainstream people think of the claims of vaccine uh, dangers or ivermectin efficacy are false. Yeah. So, yeah, like I just but, put it together so you, and yeah. uh, we can go through it if, if you guys, I mean, if you think yeah, we, we'll, now is we'll a go good time. Yeah, we'll go in a second. I just wanted to... Uh, speak to the Better Skeptics project because we featured that on yeah, Level yeah. Wisdom. It's being run by um, Alex Marinos and his girlfriend Ava. They are girlfriend now, huh? She was just partner. <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. I I, I assume so. Um, this... And and with three independent referees, and we'll we'll review. It's still ongoing at the moment, so we'll review that and see how it went at the end. The concern that I have with it is I don't know if it's equipped to judge. I think my understanding is it's equipped to judge obviously false statements, but it doesn't seem equipped to judge um, the science behind some of the claims. Like it's able to say this person said this and the evidence, the published evidence shows the opposite. I don't think it's able to, to look deeper than that and to sort of say, well, what is the, what is going on with, the spike protein, for example, I think they're able to say, well, this person said something that contradicts uh, available evidence. I'm not sure that it's able to delve as deeply as maybe would be needed to, to judge some of the truth claims that are being made. That's my sense of it, but that may be unfair and we'll find out at the end. Well, I mean, it's definitely, I think, not equipped to be the arbiter of truth, 
but I think it's a great starting point to separate the the tone from the actual facts and the rhetoric from the actual facts and let anybody who's like interested in like the, the like primary sources of the original like data to be able to make a judge judgment for him or herself rather than have to rely on like experts or talking heads or whatever to do their thinking for them. So in terms of that, at least like a collection of all the potentially wrong claims and all the evidence to or against them, I think it's it's a it's a good it's a good project, good starting point, and uh, you know definitely Alex himself says that this is just like a beta or an alpha, and hopefully mm-hmm. like if people think it's important enough or valuable enough, they can then kind of build up on it and graduate to something better, some better I don't know maybe better wider panel of judges, wider expertise I don't know, but I mean just for me it was a good good starting point to just basically have to very carefully summarize each claim and back up why exactly I think uh, the claims are false or unsubstantiated. And I mean, this is, end of the day, this is just my opinion. So I'm just going to, you know, maybe I'm wrong on some of the things, but I got the evidence to why I think I'm, I'm correct. And everybody who listens or watches can make their own assessment of the evidence. Don't listen to me. Listen to the evidence. Don't trust me. Trust the data. So the other question, I guess, or the other point is that Brett has said a few times on his podcast that the people who will write about the lab leak hypothesis, who argued that it wasn't a conspiracy, that there was evidence behind it, have some credit in the bank to be making claims about other matters. So you are someone who was right early about the lab leak hypothesis. So I guess the question is. Why? One thing that's very interesting is that there seems to be an overlap between the people who thought it was a lab leak hypothesis and also are skeptical of vaccines and um, convinced by the uh, certainty of the efficacy of ivermectin, uh, which for me is interesting because as a first principles thinker, you wouldn't necessarily assume that that would be the case. Like these are independent. These are independent questions. I guess you could make a common argument that there are institutional forces operating on all of these matters, that there is a commonality. I would sort of say, yeah, be careful, you don't overgeneralize. Um, they're not necessarily the same topic. But what's your sense? I mean, by by Brett's rating, you you have some credit in the bank. Are you seeing that overlap? And why do you think that is? And why do you disagree? Well, first of all, I think it's completely irrelevant what you have been right on before. And there's no such thing as credit in the bank just because you were right about something that doesn't mean you are somehow going to be right about other things. And this is, I think, the concept of, yeah, like, come on, I was right about lab leaks, so you better listen to me now. It's completely uh, silly. Uh, especially, yeah, given the fact that we, we were both right, I guess, which, again, I don't think, like, we're not right on the lab leak. We still don't know the origin of the virus. We maybe we're right about saying we shouldn't be dismissed, but that's, I mean, I think anybody with a very uh, basic common sense would tell you that it's, it's premature to dismiss this very probable hypothesis that very well explains the huge, huge coincidence of an outbreak on the doorstep of the laboratory that has been doing this stuff for many, many years. And like speaking of credit in the bank, does Trump get a credit in the bank as well? He was the first one, I guess, or one of the first ones to say that lab leak is plausible. And I guess, you know, the, that doesn't mean people should listen to him at all. So yeah, absolutely. I don't think that this is argument, like a complete logical fallacy of that past performance somehow guarantees future results it does not and yeah i definitely like it's a funny thing because there is a lot of overlap between like the people supporting lab leak hypothesis and people thinking that you know there's a big pharma conspiracy i guess because i mean it does both hypotheses cater to this conspiratorial mindset which uh, i mean i'm definitely not a fan of i, I never had any i don't think i never believed in any conspiracy of like the, the mainstream ones from 9 11 fake moon landings flat earth whatever 
So I was kind of, I was the outcast, I guess, in the lab leak camp because most of the people in the lab, not most, but a lot of people in the lab leak camp were these, you know, distrust of authorities, distrust of institutions kind of people. And actually a lot of, a lot of those people who thought I was like their hero of the lab leak stuff turned on me. It was like, Yuri, you were like, a, I, you lost credibility. You're a complete ph- big pharma shill. And uh, like, did they, how much did they pay you? And it's so funny that actually, like a lot of, not a lot, some of the people in Drastic, my own like colleagues have, I wouldn't say turned on me, but like really we have a difference on opinion on vaccine safety. Thank God not ivermectin. We don't have anybody in Drastic who thinks ivermectin is is really this magic drug. But like vaccine safety and all the other stuff, uh, I think uh, there's definitely some people in Drastic who thinks that Brett is actually more right on that vaccines are dangerous and whatever. So I, but I mean, personally, I don't really care about what other people think and what they thought of me before and what they think of me now. I care all only. I, what I care about is data and evidence. And if this, my, my read of the de- data and evidence is about one thing tells me that, you know, one thing is right, lab leak is pl- plausible. I'm going to say lab leak is plausible. If I see that vaccines are safe and those who are saying they're dangerous are uh, incorrect, to put it mildly, I'll call them out. And I mean, this is, this is just, yeah, I guess this is what first principles is. Like you only look at the data and you just, you should be completely, at least try to be completely close to external biases, what people telling you, what do you like, what do they think? But I mean, I'm going against my my tribe or my bubble and I'm going to be ostracized. And a lot of people have that fear. And I just, I mean, I, I don't. So we're going to go quite detailed into your... Yeah criticisms and your analysis of the evidence and the claims that have been made. Before we do that, what is your background and what is your expertise in this area? I don't, who cares? I mean, I present you evidence and claims, please evaluate them on the value of like of the evidence doesn't matter who is delivering them as long as they're delivering coherent arguments substantiated by evidence facts links so like this is it like people are like oh you should listen to robert malone because he's the inventor of mrna vaccines and he has a phd no like if he says bullshit stupid things wrong things or if he doesn't provide the evidence and there's counter evidence from coming from i don't know five-year-old Listen to the five-year-old, because like evidence trumps credentials. Anyway. Sure, I, I get that, but I think you have a what what is your background? Why why do you have a medical background? No, I don't have a medical background. I have a drug development background for the past decade or even longer. So I mean, if you need credentials, I have you know, I've been dr- developing new drugs analyzing drug development clinical trial data for the past decade or animal data first of all i've been and for for the purposes of uh, longevity analyzing studies in longevity which like most of those studies touting new longevity drugs or interventions are bullshit <laughs> so you, you you get very like good training of seeing bullshit data, seeing bullshit studies, like complete statistical aberrations by, you know, having to go through dozens and dozens of drugs and interventions for longevity, hundreds of studies, thousands of animal studies. So I've been doing that for decades. So I guess I just got a, like a trained eye on, or like allergic to bullshit. I can spot different, like inconsistencies in the reported data very, very easily. Like to me, it's just, Something scream out, and I, I call it doesn't pass the smell test. And Brad's like, oh, "Are you saying it's fake?" Yeah. What you haven't seen a fake study before, <laughs> dude? Like just in in your uh, five minutes of analyzing studies, I think two or three were retracted that you were like touting as, "Oh, ivermectin is great." Oh, oops, the Egyptian study gets pulled. Oh, like they're killing two people for every three vaccinated lives they save. Oops, that got retracted. So like. I mean, feigning uh, 
your surprise over that studies could be like not necessarily fraudulent, but like false is to me, that's just ridiculous. And just five minutes ago, you were such a huge skeptic about the Chinese claims or the Anderson claims, virologist claims that, you know, lab leak should be dismissed. You were very skeptical. You were saying like, ah, oh, they're just uh, saying the, the wrong things. And now you're like trusting blindly, whatever, Carvalho, whoever, who, who maybe you just want to trust. But like, if you actually analyze the data, analyze the study, anybody with like basic experience analyzing those things, will like huge red flags will pop up and they're like, what? It can be real. Okay, share screen. Okay, share screen. How's this? Can you see the slides? Yes. All right. So, yeah, basically, this is the slide deck that uh, I've put together to go through all of the claims, or not at least like the, the most salient claims that I think are important for us to uh, analyze or to call out in the podcasts of Brett and Heather and their guests. And like the TLDR version is that I think Brett's Faust Foundation, on, on which all of his you know, thinking is based and all of his recommendations are based are these three crucial points that he, he believes first and foremost that the current vaccines are very dangerous, much more dangerous than the establishment might want the, his viewers to believe. And second of all, that there is a, a better alternative and his better alternative is ivermectin, which he, th which he thinks is not only as efficacious, he actually thinks it's more efficacious. He claims it's up to 100% effective, or at least he used to claim that. I don't know, maybe he kind of, I think, walked back a little bit from that. He's like, now it's 85% based on the meta-analysis. But initially, he claimed it's 100%. So this is what, you know, this, this slide deck deals with, th that claim. And finally, he thinks ivermectin is very safe. Uh, and all of these things are either false. Like, the first two are, are false, in my estimation. And this, the third one is unproven because nobody has actually studied ivermectin as a long-term weekly uh, you know, drug to be taken versus what it's being used for or been used for as like once a year or twice a year, this deworming agent or antiparasitic agent, which you just take once, it kills like the uh, uh, neuronal system of the parasites. It kills the parasites. And thankfully it doesn't kill you because apparently it doesn't cross us. It doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. So it's safe enough for us to not, you know, cause the same neurological symptoms as it causes in the parasites. Although there have been documented rare neurological side effects, which, you know, uh, uh, Heather says, oh, they're very rare. We pointed them out in the Quillette piece. Heather's like, oh, they're very rare. But again, for some reason, the very, even more rare side effects of vaccines to them seem much more dangerous than any mm -hmm. rare side effects of ivermectin. So basically so, with this, yeah, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so before you go into the, the data, I think we put out a piece about ivermectin a few days ago. And one of the pieces I didn't put in there, with, which I would like to have done, is to explain why many doctors find it or why many doctors have suspicion or concerns about ivermectin working because of the way that we know that it works as an antiparasite. So, anti so ivermectin, obviously, it's not an antiviral, it's an antiparasite. And correct me if I'm wrong, this is what I understand from, from the science, is that it affects chloride channels on nerve and muscle cells. So that affects parasites. And especially worms and insect nervous system. So it paralyzes the parasite. We have the same cells, but they're in our brains. They're in our spinal column. So because ivermectin doesn't cross the blood brain barrier, it doesn't affect us the same way. But Ivan, obviously SARS-CoV-2 doesn't have muscles and nerves. So there's already a little bit of suspicion. It's like, well, why would ivermectin work? because it doesn't work in the same way as we understand it to work as an antiparasite drug, which isn't to say that it doesn't work. There are a lot of drugs that we don't know the mechanism of action, but usually when we have a drug that we don't know the mechanism of action, we at least know the area that it's affecting, like something like um, Prozac or SSRIs. We know that they inhibit serotonin reuptake. That's what they are. 
but we've disproved the idea that depression is caused by a lack of serotonin. So as, as at the moment, the mechanism of action of Prozac, for example, is officially unexplained, but at least we know it operates on neurotransmitters. And most of the other drugs that I've looked at as, as um, where the, M the MOA is unknown, we still know more or less where it affects. So it's not a complete mystery. Whereas I understand from ivermectin, and, and I'm fully open to the idea that ivermectin is, is incredibly effective. There seems to be some evidence, unclear how strong that is. But that's, yeah, just before we get into the, the detail of some of the studies, is what's your take on that as a kind of argument for like why a lot of medical people are have suspicions about it, its potential aptitude for this task? Well, I think the medical professionals have sus uh, suspicions or skepticism about ivermectin, first and foremost, because the actual human trials have not produced a consistent signal, overwhelmingly supportive of all the claims that are, are being made by people who are promoting ivermectin, like the bird or FLCC, whatever. So that's the main reason for skepticism. Uh, the second reason, yeah, because we're, we're still not even sure how it could work, how it could work, not how it works, because we're not sure it works in the human data we see. There's no conclusive signal that it does work, but from the molecular mechanism standpoint, yeah, we don't understand how it could work because it's a small molecule that basically how it all, the story of ivermectin started of with it in relation to SARS-CoV-2 is that they, in vitro, they saw that like highly, very high doses of ivermectin seem to suppress viral replication in the, in cells, in test tubes, in vitro. So, and based on that, they concluded that it could be effective as uh, in, in, in vivo, in animals, in humans. I mean, this is completely fine. This is how drug development works. You do some kind of high throughput screening of thousands or even tens of thousands of compounds. You run them through in vitro assays and see, and like you have a readout, does that inhibit viral replication at the end of the day? If it does, you then graduate to test these in, in animals. In, in, and then you, you, know, you try to then elucidate the mechanism of action and blah, blah, blah. But of course, you know, the first and foremost, you have to see a signal. Now, this signal that they saw was, as I said, with very high concentrations of ivermectin that could probably just have been toxic to cells. It could have been, it either could have killed the cells in question, which obviously would dampen the proliferation of the virus in those cells, or it could have greatly affected their, you know, homeostasis, which again would have reduced the uh, output of the virus, but also like in vivo, that's not, not a good thing because you don't really want to affect, you. essentially you don't want it to be toxic to your cells that much. And it's never actually like the doses of them using in people never ever reach the same concentration that they saw in vitro being affected. So that's again, that's, that's one of the big uh, question marks. It's not a red flag, it's the flag, it's a question mark. And that actually kind of ties just back. To, just to summarize that, the, the evidence is that very, very high doses of ivermectin were shown to affect SARS-CoV-2 in test tubes, but we never get to that level of concentration in human, like the amount of ivermectin you'd need to take to have that effect in, in your body is very, very high. So it doesn't necessarily, um, and that's how drugs normally work. Like we'd understand how they worked in a test tube and then you'd look for the same concentrations in the body and that would be, that would make sense. Is that right? Well, it, sort of, yeah. I mean, it could happen that in vivo, even lower concentrations are effective, but I mean, it, uh, usually it takes a long time and a lot of studies to actually confirm that. But yeah, like the, the basic thing you do is you first try to replicate whatever you see in, a, in, a, in vitro and you replicate it in vivo. And if, if you don't see the same effect, then you, you kind of do something different. But they didn't, didn't even try to replicate the same effect because we know that at the same level, you get toxicity and nobody actually would allow having such a high concentration of ivermectin to be prescribed off-label or not even like the, I guess, the ethical committees of, of, of potentially running such studies. Yeah. So, and okay. yeah, in terms of like the potential mechanism of action, like uh, there was this one study, this computer modeling study that uh, tried to see, is there any binding of the small molecule to the spike protein? 
And apparently it saw like potential binding to the, one of the parts of the spike protein on which it concluded that that must be the mechanism of action. But that binding is, is really, I think, uh, like it cannot explain inhibitory role of ivermectin because that binding happens to a very distant place from the actual binding of the spike protein to the ACE2 receptor. And at the same time, they also confirmed, or in that in silico study, they, they showed that the same mo molecule, ivermectin, can actually bind ACE2 receptor itself, which apparently, like the uh, uh, vaccines hesitant people claim that spike protein is toxic because it binds to the ACE2 receptor and can somehow inhibit signaling of, you know, re re angiotensin system. But for some reason that in their study that showed that ivermectin may, might do the same thing for them, that's not a problem. problem. So to me, that's, I, I, that's an interesting observation of double standards. But I think we got a little bit off track with like ivermectin's MOA. Sure, I just thought but, it was worth doing a little bit of a framing before. But what's your next slide, Yuri? I just want to go in detail into all of the claims that you know I just wanted to to go through and first and foremost yes. I think the most important point is the claim that ivermectin is somehow 100% effective which yes. you know Brett has repeated a number of times and it is based only on one study by Hector yeah. Carvalho of Argentina who which you know they did a prophylactic ivermectin study back in I guess it was like uh, summer uh, last year yeah. summer 2020 and it's a completely um, uh, very suspect study in my let, eyes let, as I said. before we before you go into the detail on this and I think you're right that this is one of the most important questions because it's one thing to talk about ivermectin being useful as a treatment for covid uh, if you've already contracted the disease and there seems to be a lot of that there are so there are many more studies for ivermectin as a treatment than there are as a prophylactic stopping you getting covid but clearly right. this question is much more significant than whether it works as a treatment because if you are advising people to take it instead of vaccines then that has far more impact on potentially whether people are contracting covid so the reliability of this claim is much more significant than the weight of evidence for treatment. So whether it's true or not, I think you're right that this is a, this is a very important question. And also I point to that there, there have now been quite interesting criticisms made of Carvalho since I think you put this slide deck together a couple of days ago. Gideon Meyerovitz Katz did a, a deep dive into that study, and I'll, I'll link to the tweet thread below, but he showed up some very concerning data that's contained in that study and also talked about sort of where it was published and how quickly it was published and some of these concerns that he was raising about it. But it, but it certainly, given that what a lot of people say about ivermectin is, look, we've got these meta studies, we've got these meta studies, we've got this weight of evidence, and this is why, this is why it's being advised. It's clearly the case that the 100% efficacy is dependent on this one study. Like to, to say the evidence shows that, that ivermectin is something like 100% effective at preventing COVID is reliant on this one study from Carvalho that Pierre Corey talked about several times on the, on the podcast with Brett and also on the podcast with, with Joe Rogan. So it's not, it's not nitpicking on your behalf or other people's behalf to say, no, this is a very significant claim and it's, it's solely reliant on this study. So I think it's worth framing that before we go into what might otherwise seem like, um, yeah, nitpicking or deliberately kind of focusing on the weakest parts of the argument. No, this is something that has been made. These are claims that have been made by the ivermectin advocates and, and they are incredibly significant claims. So yeah, I'll, I'll let you, Right, yeah, because this these are actually like the two pillars on which all of Brad's platform stands are, one of them is that ivermectin is as effective, if not more effective as vaccines, and the other pillar is that vaccines are very dangerous. If you take away either one, the whole platform falls apart. So I think it's very important to show that actually both of the pillars are false, 
but let's start with ivermectin and show that yeah like it's totally unsubstantiated to claim that it's 100 percent effective or anywhere near 100 percent effective so as i mentioned it's it's a very uh, low quality study it's not a randomized trial not placebo controlled therefore not blinded it's basically people who decided they want to use ivermectin, they were put in the group who taking ivermectin and those who didn't were in the control group, or maybe even, I don't know, maybe they used, well, they claimed that they actually, you know, assigned people to the control group, but it's possible sometimes people like doing such trials, and I know how these trials are done, they'll say that, yeah, yeah, we had a perspective group, but actually they'll just re retrospectively say, okay, let's just take those patients uh, that we, you know, treated and we'll say they were the control group. I'm not saying this is what they've done, but uh, it, like even without that, this study is very suspicious because the biggest point of suspicion is uh, the huge, huge discrepancy in infection numbers, infection rates between the two groups. Like the treatment group got zero, yeah, like zero out of 600 people got COVID in the in the group treated by the ivermectin. Whereas the control group got 92%, like in one of the hospitals, the, the primary hospital where like the sponsor of the study, they got 92% effectivity, 120 out of 130 people in the control group got COVID. And like, this is a huge mind blowing discrepancy because on all the other studies, even from Argentina and even from other hospitals, like the infectivity rate, the positivity rate was like in the single digits of percentage wise, like 5%, 10%, even in the pilot, in the very, like, because this study was had first the pilot study and then the main study in their pilot, the infectivity rate was 11% in the control group. How it got into 92% is, is beyond me. So it's very suspicious. And, and uh, just to say, just to say that it's not only you saying that, I've spoken to quite a few doctors and they argue that you just don't get 100%. Like even the most, the best drugs we have, like the antiviral for HIV, it's like 90%. And even Tess Laurie, who's one of the main ivermectin campaigners in the interview that I did with her, also admitted that she understood why people were suspicious of this study because of that. So even Tess Laurie uh, accepts that there is something about these results that, that does seem unusual and potentially, um, I wouldn't say suspicious. I'm sure she wouldn't use that word, but certainly she she accepts that it's that she understands why people find it suspicious. Right, absolutely. This is a little different point that it, the efficacy is unprecedented. I was making a point that the difference in just the groups, like the statistical observation of what happens between the two groups, the discrepancy is huge. Never mind, is this the fact of the drug or is this something else? But like, you don't get like one group getting zero out of 600 and the other getting uh, you know, almost 100% of the outcome you're looking for in like in any well-designed trial. Uh, but yes, the efficacy itself, like having something with 100% efficacy is uh, like a, a miracle. And in this case, I think it's a miracle in the bad sense of the word because it's completely un unbelievable. And this is why this study is actually a clear outlier if you look at other prophylaxis studies that have been done by other other places like this 100 percent efficacy is a clear outlier with this like comparable uh, sample size and there are varying varying other much lower efficacy numbers reported in other studies so cherry picking that you want to believe just this one rather than the like more well-designed trials that show a much lower uh, effectiveness for example there is this uh uh, randomized control trial with a 50% efficacy. Like, but why, like, Brett even chooses to dismiss it out of hand and not talk about it. He only talks about like 85% to like 87% efficacy. But there's this very nice randomized trial with like 600 people per group, compar comparable to Carvalho with like two different, uh, it's, it's uh, registered and randomized placebo control. So, that minimizes bias and it has to be like prospectively selected those people assigned to those groups and it shows only a 50 percent efficacy and uh, actually yeah later on I'll, I'll get back to that study but just this study alone the Carvalho study also has a big methodological red flags one of the biggest ones to me was that it between the pilot study and the main study they went and changed their treatment protocol and also, don't forget that this study is not ivermectin alone. This study is ivermectin plus this 
Karaginan or Karaginan, some would say, I, I, I prefer Karaginan, uh, that they used as uh, like topical nasal spray and mouth spray to apparently they, they think it prevents the virus from entering the I know, mucous membranes or whatever. Like basically it's like an extra level of mask or like protection to prevent the virus from getting into our cells. So this is a combination study, but uh, in the pilot, they gave people ivermectin five times a day with this, you know, very kind of small dose of 0.2 milligrams. And then they switched to 12 milligrams once per week. And like, this is completely different pharmacodynamics of uh, and pharmacokinetics of, of the drug with just once weekly or once every five days that, uh, I mean, you don't normally do this. I mean, you can't do this within the context of the same trial normally. Uh, like you wouldn't be like allowed, you'd need to essentially reset, restart from scratch if you changed the protocol that much. But I mean, to them, it seemed okay. And this is how they published. And again, they published, it's not really, a, it's not a paper per se. They, they say, well, we published in the peer reviewed journal. It's like four pages of very short, concise summary of what they've done. And like, no way to validate the raw data or anything else of the sort there. Like uh, the protocol is very, very short excerpts of what they've done. Um, yeah, and I'll just, I'll just read from the thread that Gideon put together on this, that the other issues that he had with it are that the, it was received, accepted, and published in seven days, which he says is incredibly unusual in academia. The journal it was published in only has one issue with seven papers in total. Um, so it's a very small journal. Um, he, I think he says that it's a pay to publish journal um, and also goes through, he goes through the data and basically shows that a lot of the totals of the number of people in the, that there's huge discrepancies in the data between how many people were in the group, were in all of the groups and the pre-registration doesn't match the publication. Um, the pre-registration says, for example, there are 72 women in the control arm. Table one reports 51. Um, the pre-registration shows a median age of 42. But according to the table that was published, 70% um, had an age below 40. That's, that's logistically impossible, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to put this link below for people who are interested, but, it, but it's pretty incredibly damning in terms of what it shows about the data in the study. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say it's incredibly damning of the data in the study. It's basically showing how incompetent the people writing the study or organizing the study are, but it doesn't mean the data is still, like the ultimate data, underlying data of the study doesn't mean it's fake. Mm. Like what I, I think the methodological problems that I outlined here are much bigger problems with the study, not to mention the, the result that, you know, discrepancy of 0% versus 92% of the group getting covid like, to me, that is the huge red flag. I mean, yeah, it's published in some, like, low-ranking journal, but I don't care. It could be a preprint for all I care. I all care about the data, and I want to be able to verify the data. I don't care. I don't like this this Egyptian study, El Ghazar, that was pulled because there's plagiarism in the introduction. Who cares? I mean, yeah, it's bad. I mean, you got slap on the wrist. You don't do this in academia, but it doesn't mean the data is fake. What's damning is the, the fake data, apparently, like the people who were included were already dead at the time. Like that to me is a big deal. All of the other things, like it's, it just seems that people are piling on just for the sake of piling on. Like to me, that doesn't make or break a study. What makes or breaks a study to me is the, if I see a statistical anomaly, if I see a methodological problem with like five times a day versus once a week, to me, like this is, ah, this can be in a, done in a clinical trial. Um, and finally, yeah, I, I already mentioned like the, the biggest question mark for me, can we swear on this podcast, is that, sure. uh, is that like the zero versus 120 out of 130 people. Like to me, this is a huge, huge red flag. So uh, basically, as I, as I mentioned, there are other studies with other prophylaxis studies which much, with much lower efficacy, which I think... You can't say that, you know, ivermectin is 100% effective if there are studies 
that show much if like a much bigger number of studies show nowhere near 100% efficacy. And also you have to be very careful to understand how efficacy works. Basically between a 90% efficacy and 100% efficacy, there's like a huge, huge discrepancy because to people it might seem, oh, like, or, okay, let's not take 100% because yeah, like Brett makes points. It, it's infinitely better than anything because if you divide by zero, yeah, you get infinity. But like say, between like a 99% efficacy and 95% efficacy, you have to look at like the inverse. So basically it's 1% of the people got COVID or 5% of the people got COVID compared to the, the, the control group. And that's a five time difference. Like it's, it's huge. It's not like you can't, you don't, you think 99 and 95 are close. No, they're like worlds apart. And here the same is true about like 50% efficacy and 90% efficacy, they're like worlds apart and a, a well done trial well done, a randomized control trial of prophylactic efficacy of ivermectin reported a 50% efficacy. So how can you claim that uh, ivermectin is 100% effective if their trials that you know show much, much lower uh, percentage uh, is, is beyond me? And not only that, that 50% that efficacy is still, uh, it's still a very wide range of statistical significance or confidence basically because it's still a small sample size. You need a much bigger sample size for these prophylactic studies because the effect is that like you get like 30 out of 600. So to have a, to, to be sure that this is not a statistical aberration, you need thousands of people in the two arms to be able to say, okay, there's a statistically significant difference. And we can say with high confidence, it's between like 55 and then 60% versus in this case, it's like 24 and 70% efficacy. Like it's a huge range. Like, as I said, it's several times difference between what it could be. And so that's one aspect. The other aspect is, yeah, this is uh, not a well-designed study at all. It's not a randomized control, placebo control study at all. And so the bias it could have had is, is unbelievable. Not just like, forget about outright faking data. It could be just a bias of people participating and some of them choosing not to report their infections and like with the best of intentions, not to fake the study, but they're like, oh, okay, I got a positive PCR test, but it's not because I, not because of ivermectin, I just skipped a dose of ivermectin or I, I did something wrong. And it's not the study's fault, not ivermectin's fault, but I think it's my fault. So why don't I not report my positive PCR test to the organizers of the study? And, you know, several people thinking that might greatly affect the outcome of the study. That's why you do double blind placebo control so that the people taking ivermectin just don't know what they're taking. And the researchers actually don't know what the doctors, you know, uh, uh, tracking those patients, don't know what their patients are taking until the end of the, when you, the results are in and you do the unblinding and you're like, oh shit, it doesn't work. <laughs> Which is a constant theme in drug development. Um, but when trials are done properly in the format that I said, randomized double blind, the, uh, the purported like great efficacy of ivermectin, which as you rightfully pointed out, mostly has been studied in the context of treatment, not in the context of prophylaxis, because it's actually much more important, I think, for because there's just nothing for, for treatment if people already got COVID. For prevention, we have vaccines again, like all the smart people are okay with vaccines. But in terms of treatment, if you actually got it, there's just no very little effective things other than actually, you know, steroids, dexamethasone, it actually could be uh, you know, uh, decreasing mortality rates and, and such. So it's very important for people to find new things. And that's why overmectin has been studied in the context of treatment much more widely than in the context of prophylaxis. But when actually the studies of treatment are done properly, all this magic disappears. Iver Ivermectin is actually shown to be not effective. And uh, I've have in this slide, I have four different trials randomized uh, controlled trials, which have found that no, ivermectin does not exhibit any statistically significantly statistically significant efficacy. Mm. So four different trials, I mean, different regimens, but basically the underlying theme is that wh whatever people found out before that they thought ivermectin is going to be very effectively, when they rerun the same protocol, of this, uh, yeah, the same approach in a, in a properly done randomized controlled trial, the, they don't see the same result. It's not reproducible, which is like to, this is what people with drug development experience know what usually happens. You, you have this great result in an animal model 
and then you actually do something in in humans in actual ra randomized control trials and it just doesn't doesn't or the observational study in humans even they're like oh my god like the, look at the correlation between this and that but when you actually try to do an intervention on it it disappears so it's usually like this is uh, and i think i forget who made this great point there's this podcast uh uh i forget i'm drawing a blank but basically the, the two very career credential people with experience in drug development say that the expectation is that most of the drugs will fail most of the phase two trials will not be reproduced in phase three just because it's actually like the things the signals you think you see will disappear with a larger sample size so the expectation actually is whatever you see in observational studies be highly skeptical about it because usually when you rerun the same thing in a uh, you know observe uh, interventional studies those effects will disappear as they are disappearing here, as they disappear with hydroxychloroquine and are actually with hydroxychloroquine, they showed to uh, make things worse, like apparently 10% higher chance of mortality on, on hydroxychloroquine. Same thing, and ivermectin will be the next hydroxychloroquine as I think David Gorski uh, very nicely had this headline, which I tweeted today and people are like, but David Gorski was against the lab leak hypothesis. And I'm like, I don't care. It doesn't make him, you know, I don't, I don't evaluate whatever people said before. I value what they're saying now. And moreover, when the this uh, very interesting Argentinian study, randomized uh, controlled trial out of Argentina, showed that ivermectin might actually, like hydroxychloroquine before, it might actually be making things worse. In this case, those who were taking ivermectin uh, they had to be put on the ventilator and they progressed into the, to be hospitalized. Those taking ivermectin had to be put on the ventilator five days earlier than those who weren't. So apparently it could be making things worse. Uh, so we have to be very careful of, you know, recommending it and saying like, this is the safest drug ever because 4 billion people took it over the period of 30 years. Oh, but they took it just once a year, but you know, I think it's safe. So you guys take it on a weekly basis. All right, I'm ready to go to the next claim. If you have any questions on ivermectin, or at least on this claim, I think I might have uh, some other uh, slides on ivermectin later on, some particular claims. But in terms of like the pillar of uh, uh, Brett's platform, I, I think I've addressed in full. Yeah, I mean, the main, the, the, from what I heard in Brett and Heather's podcast, the response to your article, their main criticism was that your your criticism of the Carvalho study was based on the that people were taking it as a prophylactic once a week and that you were very skeptical because of the half-life of ivermectin was 18 hours. And I understand your argument to be, well, that means that there's barely any ivermectin left in the system after a few days, therefore it can't work. And their response to that was that's a complete logical fallacy because we don't know that ivermectin works because of its concentration in the blood. So you're assuming that there's a certain level of, of the drug that needs to be present, and that's not necessarily true. So you arguing, well, this drug couldn't possibly work in the way that they're saying is, is logically false. No. I'm not really arguing it's logically false between it can't, because it can't work on a weekly regimen. What I'm saying, it's, it's, it's false because of the data. I think the data is false. So relying on that Carvaya study when there is, uh, you know, a dozen other studies with lower efficacy is, is you know, a false thing to do. Uh, but even, yeah, just on, on the, this dosing regimen alone, I'm very skeptical because of the half-life of 18 hours, which means that, yeah, if you... If you want to take it prophylactically, you have to maintain, uh, you know, a certain level of the drug in your system. And if it disappears within, or at least drops to like 1% within like three days, the other four days of the week, you're essentially unprotected. And remember, like if we, we were talking initially the concentration that they observe in vitro that was effective in prevent because like lower concentrations in vitro, they were not effective. They did not prevent viral replications. So needs a very high concentration in, the, in plasma or in cells to prevent viral replication. And if you take in the drug and you know within 18 hours, it's just half of it. Within a day, it's, within three days, it's just 1% of it. And within the time, the rest of the week, 
and it's like 0. 0.000, like it's minuscule, undetectable. Then there's, I think, like the half-life does not support the proposed weekly regimen to a, like a drug development person or I think a medical doctor. Like if you if if a medical doctor will give you prophylaxis, like antibiotics or whatever, they they have to make sure that the, the you know the dosing regimen that you put the drug in your system supports something that will maintain a certain level of the drug in your system. And that to hypothesize that, oh, but maybe it hides in your fat cells and then gets released or, or something, I think it's uh, basically trying to uh, substantiate your wishful thinking with, again, they're, like, they're saying, but we don't know how it works. Well, we don't know how it works in the first place. And we don't even like if it did work and how it works in the in vitro studies, that somehow this, for some reason, you even decouple the efficacy in vitro from the plasma concentration. That's like double, uh, uh, I think, a logical fallacy that uh, to make any kind of claims that, oh, but, you know, because it was used as a deworming agent and it was seemed efficacious even prophylactically on a very, like a very infrequent basis, well, it just kills parasites. It could have killed the larva that was present in, in, in you. And that's why it works prophylactically on a, like a bi-monthly or a bi, bi-yearly basis. Who knows? But to, in like the larva, uh, uh, the eggs of parasites concentration, like 50,000 eggs in, in, in one experiment compared to like billions of virions of SARS-CoV-2 are like completely different world that you, you you try to make an equivalence between the mechanisms of action in one uh, embodiment versus another embodiment, like viral versus parasitic, which is like, to my mind is again, completely unsubstantiated conjecture, conjecture land. Yeah, this so, is yeah, I was just I've, making a claim yeah. like bread's like, oh, yeah. take it weekly. It's going to be like weekly is enough or not just bread, but like it's, it's actually coming from, I guess, Pierre Corey and the FLCC. Like, why weekly? Like, what are you basing this on? I mean, it, it not, uh, not on the plasma level. Like, weekly doesn't work. It has to be at least, I don't know, bi-weekly or tri-weekly to make sure that the, like, the, the drop-off in the concentration, the exponential drop-off is then kind of replenished, that you have some kind of baseline that you are protected against COVID. Because, you know, if, if the concentration drops... And it's not nowhere. It's not found in your lung cells or your nasal cavity where the, the initial attack of the viral pathogen happens. How do you think it could be protected? And the idea so, that it can somehow hide in the fat cells and then jump out when it sees the I, I, I think virus. it's worth, Yuri. I think it's worth making a point here because I've seen people make this argument and get this confused because they they say, for example, look. In Africa, and it's used as a treatment. We know it's used as a treatment for river blindness and for other parasites. The regime in Africa is can be once every three months or even once every year. So we know that it works. But the the mistake that people are making there is that okay, as an anti parasite, the way that it works is you take the drug, and it kills any of the eggs, it kills any of the parasites in your system. So that's why you take it once every three months. That's why you take it once every year what you're arguing in terms of it working as a prophylactic against a drug against um, the virus coming into your body is a completely different thing. So those two things are not comparable. I've seen comments made about that. There is some suggestion that the reason that COVID has not spread so well in Africa is because there are lots of people taking ivermectin and it's acting as a prophylactic. But at the moment, as far as I understand, that's a kind of um, that's a hypothesis and an observational claim. Yeah, it's just very weak hypothesis of mistaking correlation for causation. Heather made that argument. I'm actually, I actually have it in the slide deck. I'll get to it. And sure. Yeah, I mean, this is, again, this is not, not evidence at all of potential ivermectin's efficacy. Yeah, I just want to put the the other counter arguments from Brett and Heather about ivermectin specifically, which is that in your Quillette article, you confused prophylaxis and treatment. No, we did not. I have a slide on that as well. So you get okay, so we'll come to that in a minute. The other issue, um, 
that they argue that the point that you're making about ivermectin being a teratogen is actually disproved by the paper that you cited? Slide coming. Slide coming. Okay. And one other question, because I know some people watching will be saying, well, all of this, you're, you're just nitpicking on one or two studies. We know that the evidence is overwhelming for ivermectin. You look at the graphs from places like India, you look at the graphs from places around the world where ivermectin was used and the infections went way down. Why are you even concentrating on these scientific studies when the, the evidence is so overwhelming elsewhere? Because it's not evidence. It's mistaking correlation for causation. And yeah, like the, her, Heather's use of like India as an example, betrays lack of knowledge what actually goes on in India and the ivermectin was never really used as a prophylactic there I mean it was just very little spots of some doctors using it as prophylactic nowhere like it wasn't widely used as a prophylactic it was only recommended as potential treatment for mild COVID for people you know if they got COVID they stay at home they're like the recommendation from the Indian health ministry was consider taking three days of ivermectin or up to like between three and five days of ivermectin. And, you know, if you get worse, actually go to the hospital and the correlation of like what actually when things went down, the numbers of the infections went down to equate that with any sort of, you know, use of ivermectin is I think completely wrong because things like new infections fall, rise and fall, first of all, you know, by themselves, for some reason, we don't understand, like, why do waves spike and then fall? We can kind of see them burning out uh, with, like, people in pockets of urban centers or with lockdowns or with other, with other measures or with vaccinations, that they actually could be decreasing the, the rates of new infections. But to say that that's because of prophylactic ivermectin, which never really was widespread, widely used in India, uh, is, is beyond ridiculous. And just, yeah, again, like making inferences between the difference between Indian states is, I think, the difference between states in the United States, they're like the dynamics of, you know, why does in one state, you know, the waves happen and in the other state, it, it stays very calm, but then like it's actually different dynamic when things have fallen, I don't know, in Florida, then they spike in the Northwest or whatever. <laughs> to make any kind of inferences and, and correlation because, because of those things and equate them to the use of ivermectin is uh, like a very juvenile logical error. And do you have any, you, you mentioned Peru before as well. Are there any other? Right. Yeah, Peru is, a, I think is a good, very sad example of people kind of trusting this ivermectin narrative. And it was, it was actually kind of widespread use in Peru. I don't know as much whether it was prophylactic or treatment, but basically Peru was then like number one in deaths per capita. And there it was actually widely used, uh, uh, I think more as, as a treatment, but completely ineffective. And people uh, have, the Peruvian doctors have kind of, you know, said that, that they're disappointed in you know, Ivermectin precisely because it didn't prevent those, those deaths from happening, at least deaths. I'm not even talking about infections. So unfortunately, yeah, the evidence does not support really any any efficacy for ivermectin either as prophylactic or as treatment in my mind i mean those studies that people say is overwhelming evidence i think it's like completely in uh, unconvincing evidence that as i said once those studies are done properly once those protocols in the studies are done properly under uh you know randomized control trials those effects will disappear and just let's just hope they don't show actually negative effects like they did for hydroxychloroquine Okay, Yuri, so let's continue with your slide deck. Sure. So I guess coming to the next pillar of you know the position of bread that vaccines are, or first of all, this is not that vaccines are dangerous. This is a claim just made recently by Heather, I think it was in my 89th podcast, that she thinks there's not enough evidence that vaccines are preventing transmission at all, which I think again, betrays a certain level of incompetence of in you know vex, drug development or vaccine assessment. Basically, there's already been so much evidence that vaccines do decrease transmissions, prevent transmissions, 
uh, either so, as asymptomatic so just, viral shedding. Yeah. So just to to pull apart that, so I'm sure that I understand what's being claimed. So this would mean if there's if there's no evidence that vaccines are preventing transmission, then that would mean that vaccines didn't stop people getting COVID. It would have to mean that people still got COVID, but it would just it was just symptomatic. So the only thing that vaccines would do is prevent you getting very, very sick. It wouldn't stop you getting COVID, which seems odd to me. Yeah, and then like in breakthrough infections, for example, if, if, if you were vaccinated, but you still got COVID, that it somehow does not reduce your, your viral shedding at all. The vaccines and does not prevent future transmissions in those vaccinated. That's untrue, as, as shown in like this table of many studies that have assessed this. That this is just not the case. And uh, I think also the actual now in in this case again, like I, I guess maybe I'm a little guilty of mistaking correlation for causation. But at least in in when we actually see what happens in countries that have like great vaccination percentages. It, it has a drop off greatly in the in the number of new cases or future future new cases, unless of course there's a breakthrough variant or. But basically, uh, the the underlying understanding that vaccines, at least in the period of still heightened immunity, heightened uh, you know anti neutralizing antibodies, which you know for these vaccines it seems like maybe three months, maybe four months is a sweet spot. And then it actually drops off pretty pretty steeply. In that in that period, we definitely see that vaccines reduce transmission, reduce like with a high enough percentage of of people vaccinated, they greatly stop the spread of of COVID and reduce like new daily infections, reduce the kind of the average or not of of the virus or the variant in circulation. So I think questioning that you know these vaccines have efficacy at, at reducing uh, transmissions or preventing transmissions, I think is just wrong. So this is just one point I wanted to address, yeah. uh, but then going into like the actual pillar of vaccines are dangerous, I think kind of the, the false claim that's gotten the most play in the anti-vaccine circles uh, has been this claim that vaccines somehow peak in your ovaries. I think Steve Kirsch was the one who spearheaded this claim. I don't know if it was made before him, but I've seen it kind of propagated on Twitter by other people. And they're just like, oh my God. So this, the is, so this is a claim that was made in the podcast with Robert Malone and Steve Kirsch. Yeah, saving the world or something. Yeah, three steps, I guess, to save the world. Yeah, it was Malone and Kirsch. And so Kirsch showed this graph and everybody, nobody challenged him on it. And this was ridiculous because it, it, for anybody who is at least, you know, in, has passing familiarity with the technical document, like the summary of the studies where this graph is coming from, if they actually looked at the table of biodistribution, like I did, they would remember that no, ovaries were like nowhere near the peak, nowhere near the maximum of neither concentration nor the actual, like the dosage of the vaccine that is, is uh, that is shown to be in, in those organs. And some people say, well, Steve didn't mean that peaks like, the, Steve didn't mean the ovaries are the organ with the maximum concentration. He meant something else. He meant like, oh, it actually the peak is, I don't know. Some people tried to come up with excuses, but no, Steve Kirsch actually did mean that the ovaries are the organ with the biggest kind of fire. Here's the quote from his uh, trial site news article, which he wrote way, way before the podcast. Basically, that's what has gotten him on Brett Weinstein's podcast. And he says that, you know, and he, like, this is a ridiculous thing. He writes that the natural COVID infection travels slowly through your body. The vaccine takes about 15 minutes to set fire to every part of your body at the same time. And the biggest fire is in your ovaries, right, Steve Kirsch. And this is why, if you have a side effects from vaccine, it can happen anywhere. But basically, this conclusively, without a doubt, proves that no, Steve Kirsch really did mean peaks in the ovaries. And that is absolutely false, because if you look at the actual table with the biodistribution, so the ovaries are right here. Here's a graph. I mean, here's the table that he used for that graph or not he didn't use for that graph it turns out that actually he just pulled that graph off some panda so, 
Sorry, Yuri, do you do you have the actual graph that that was? I do taken have the from? actual graph. I just wanted to show that these numbers, yeah. like if you look at the numbers, you right away see that the, the ovaries are like concentration of twelve, but then you got spleen with a concentration of twenty three, you got liver with a concentration of twenty four, you got adrenal glands with a concentration of eighteen, and you got the injection site with a concentration of one hundred and sixty five. Yeah. Do you have that? So, do you have that? The yeah. Yeah, I so I think it's important to show the graph. Okay. That, so there we oh, go. So this, so let's see the, the, the one with the injection site. So we've seen this graph. No, we haven't seen this that, graph. Basically, this is the original yeah. graph, the panda graph that Steve used on the podcast. Yes. Then that panda group revised their graph because people like me or others have pointed out, like, are you guys crazy? Yeah. Why did you omit the other organs? They put in the other organs with higher concentrations. So the ovaries are yeah. here. And then, then can we see the one with the injection site? Yeah, yeah, I'll get there. I'll get there. Sure. I just want to show you that the, the peak in the ovaries somehow, even in those uh, other organs, is no peak at all because you got the liver and the spleen with twice as big a concentration. And when you actually plot the injection site, the concentration in the injection site, this trumps by far any of the other observed concentration. And like the ovaries are hiding down here somewhere. And this is the the level of the concentration in the injection site at the, at the like the forty-eight hour times time spot. So, so this I mean, was this, the, claim so is this was the suggestion that the the concentration in the that it doesn't it was supposed to stay in the injection site and it doesn't stay in the injection site and it goes through the body. But from what well, I there's a different claim. That's that actually yeah. is a different claim that I, I have another slide about. But this is yeah. just the completely false claim. That somehow ovaries are your the biggest concentrate the, the organ with the biggest concentration and that freaked a lot of people out like i had my yeah. friends who are smart scientifically minded people they're like why did i let my daughter get vaccinated now she's going to be infertile for the rest of your of her life i'm like wait a second okay let's just dig through the data and you actually if you dig through the data and i have this slide that you made me skip over come on man don't rush me i got this uh, layout in uh, for a reason this slide shows that just under the source of that the table for on which the graph is based there is a sentence that says that the researchers having noticed the signal in the ovaries then examined the morphology of the organs and did not see any urban abnormalities and then they ran a subsequent study to verify that there's no negative effect on a reproduction there's no reproductive toxicity no effect on the fetus no effect on whatever and they confirmed it and it says this exactly in the same document where supposedly you would look to get the data from and this was like the first signal to me that steve actually didn't look at the document because when i pointed this out on twitter he asked me on twitter like What's your reference for this? And I'm like, dude, it's like right there where the data for the, your graph is. And so there's no reason to freak out. There's no, no signal of reproductive toxicity. Like these vaccines have been shown safe from the reproductive standpoint on a number of occasions. And even in humans, in subsequent human trials, they confirmed this. So there's just no reason to be freaked out. And the fact that Steve Kirsch, by this fear mongering, made a lot of people freak out, I think should be greatly uh, like there should be consequences i'm just yes. gonna leave it at that yeah i mean i i looked in there's a document that steve kirsch put together so steve Kirsch put together this document which meant that brett invited him onto the the show if you look through that document it there are a lot of claims in there that seem incredibly exaggerated like the 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 language in it is I mean, people watched, if people watched the interview with Steve Kirsch and Robert Malone, they probably aren't surprised that Steve Kirsch is not a particularly careful person. I mean, he was, a lot of people, even in the comments below the video, were saying this guy's unwatchable. This guy just keeps talking over people. And it's, it's clear that, like, he argued things like 82% of pregnancies ended in miscarriage after the after the vaccine which is just insane like the the idea that that could be the case and would never be picked up and all of these medical professionals were seeing all of this happening and none of them spoke out and none of them raised it just it just beggars belief 
I mean, some of the some of the questions seem very technical, but some of them you get into territory where the the conspiracy required to cover it up would be so immense that anyone with a bit of common sense would say, okay, maybe this doesn't really make sense. And then I think yeah. this, this this point that you're about to make with this slide is one of the most. I don't know how anyone could say this, believe this, and remain credible as a as a source. Whatever you think about vaccine safety, whatever you think about that there may be issues with these experimental vaccines, which I understand why people may think that and may have some, some genuine concerns. If you make a claim like this, and I've heard it, I've heard this same claim from multiple people in these kind of anti-vaccine circles. And for me, it shows the size of their echo chamber that no one has no one has challenged it. They've not had it challenged, and that they still repeat it as if it's true. Um, so yeah, what is the claim? Right. So the claim is that they've skipped animal trials, and I think this is just a case of a broken telephone that someone put out. Like it was, a, I think, a December article somewhere that oh my god, they skipped some trials, some animal trials, which people who have uh, very little understanding of the drug development pathway don't realize that like vaccines have different requirements for whatever animal trials are required than for example I don't know small molecules or I don't know gene therapies whatever some things that you are, keep uh, putting in your body on a regular basis versus a vaccine which you just do one injection or like two injections in the span of weeks or months so basically there's some exemptions like for animal trials and also at the same time, they, they could expedite the process of some long-term trials, which they can, uh, for these vaccines, I think they authorize in parallel that before they finalize the animal trial on some, I think, long-term chronic uh, uh, administration, but and they already didn't see a signal in, in toxicity, they said, that, okay, now you can start the human trial, the human safety trial, and then basically the ones will we'll wait till the, until the report on the animal trial, and, but we, that should prevent you from starting to set up the human trial and maybe even dose the human patients. So that that then turned into this in a broken telephone way that they skipped all animal trials. And yeah, that beggars believe, like how can anybody claim this, especially after like you were just talking about rat ovaries and data in rats, and now you're saying that they skipped animal trials. And like, cause so I just don't understand how they made the claim. But basically, yeah, we we have in in the same very same common technical document from which uh, Steve or Panda extracted the the numbers for for their biodistribution graphs. You have dozens of mentions of different animal trials of you know mice, rats, non-human primate, maybe even beagle dogs. Usually, you know, they, they also test. I don't know. But basically, I mean, no, animal trials were not skipped. They tested the vaccine in animal trials before they tested in humans. And obviously, the, nobody would ever let the vaccine to be authorized, even the emergency use authorization, if it didn't show safety in humans. So forget the animal trials. Like, this vaccine has been tested and proven safe in humans. So I don't understand how you can be like doing this scaremongering thing and thinking that, oh, you found this kind of error that all of the developers, vaccine developers and regulators oversaw. They, they didn't understand that the ovaries are the place for the biggest fire. Well, no, maybe it's just you are, you know, a little uh, out of your depth here. Yeah. And, and so this is leading to say, right I mean, into be, the next. I, I'd like to know what people mean when they say it skipped animal trials, but you have to you have to, and there may they may come up with some excuse or some reason, oh, well, it was this particular thing that they didn't do. But if you look at the quotes and you look at what people have said, what will most people hear when they say you skipped animal trials? They'll immediately think, whoa, wow, these, these vaccines were so, were rushed through so quickly that they didn't even do the proper testing on it. That's what people will hear. So if they've got another version of what they want to argue, then they need to clearly say that rather than yeah, exactly. effectively, because, effectively scaremonger and say that it didn't have animal trials. Yeah, that, that argument morphs into, they didn't even test the vaccines in animals before testing in yeah. humans. This is what the kind of the broken telephone result of this argument was that's getting repeated and repeated on social media, usually by like those with a uh, lower level of understanding, like you can't have skipped animal trials. Like it's just, 
you know, not possible. Like all that, like you, you, the vaccine was tested in animals before being tested in humans. But that claim about uh, like vaccine safety and the ovaries then got translated into like the vaccine is dangerous for women. At some level, Brad says it's crazy. At some level, it's not even safe for women out at all. And again, this is just scaremongering. The vaccine has been proven safe for all aspects of female health. And to say that it's, you know, it's not safe for women at all is completely false and misleading. So in the interest of time, I'll just leave it, I'll leave it right there and go to the next point, which is Robert Malone's favorite point, that the spike protein itself is somehow very dangerous and cytotoxic. And that's why you shouldn't be using mRNA vaccines because they deliver the blueprint for the spike protein, which then kind of gets, although it does get anchored to the cell membrane, some part of it gets cleaved and starts floating around our organism, floating around our body, wreaking havoc on cells. Why? Because Steve, uh, not Steve, Robert Malone misunderstood the study out of Salk by Uri Manor, who have shown that at doses even like 40,000 times higher than whatever is seen in vaccinated subjects, the spike protein is, yeah, it could be cytotoxic to cells, but it's not the lone free-floating spike protein. It's actually spike protein, like the HIV pseudotype virus, uh, pseudotype of the spike protein that could wreak some havoc to uh, the, basically connecting to the ACE2 receptor. And, but the toxicity was seen because of the actual pseudotype particles entering the cells. But, and those concentrations were, again, 40,000 times greater than whatever is observed. And the next study, another study, actually looked at whatever Steve claims, the actual spike protein. Because in the Uri Manor study, it wasn't spike protein, it was a virion. Virion, mm -hmm. like full-fledged virion with spike protein sticking out of it. So whatever like, he thinks spike protein might be doing is not really transferable to whatever we see in the vaccines. Because in the vaccines, what he's claiming is we observe some level of free floating spikes in the blood. We do for like the, the first uh, 14 days at the, at the most, the concentration, I think it peaks at like day three or four. It's minuscule, it's like picograms per milliliter of this free floating spike. And it's actually lower than what people with COVID who actually have COVID are observed to have of the free floating spike in their serum, but still we do observe it, but to expect any kind of bad uh, result on cells with cell cytotoxicity because of that free floating spike is not supported by any evidence. In this study, the separate study, which actually used free floating spike, they injected it into the lungs of the mice, injected like through lavage, basically the intertracheally, put it into the lungs. In, in, in this study, they used concentrations a hundred times greater than what's observed in humans after vaccinations. And those mice were okay. They didn't die. They did exhibit inflammation. Obviously, you, you, you put a huge dose of a foreign protein into the lungs. They did show inflammation and they did show some decrease in body weight. But within the uh, 72 hours of, where's my cursor here? Within the 72 hours, their body weight actually recovered almost to the levels of the control group. So they didn't die. They didn't have any kind of horrible effects. They did show inflammation, but then they recovered. So to expect any kind of huge toxicity of the spike in doses 100 times lower than we see in, in humans, uh, or in those mice when we see in humans, absolutely not supported by any data and is fear-mongering. And we've had trials of hundreds of thousands of patients, trials, clinical trials with vaccines in aggregate. And now we have billions of people who've been vaccinated no uh, like observed toxicity of, of the spike protein whatsoever. And furthermore, there's actually a vaccine that Robert Malone in, in endorsed. And the vaccine is called Novavax and the vaccine carries the spike protein. It's made of the actual, like it's not mRNA vaccine, it's the actual spike protein on, on a nanoparticle. And for some reason, Robert Malone in Twitter is like endorsed this vaccine. So I see some kind of cognitive dissonance. If he's so scared of free floating spikes, why is he endorsing these, vac these vaccines where, which are composed of spikes? So I, I think, you know, basically the scaremongering that has been going on about this uh, cytotoxic spine has no spike, has no basis, in fact, whatsoever. Uh, if you have any questions on that, uh, if um, not, I mean, I don't have any theirs. questions. I mean, I would, I would be interested in what the response is from, from 
the the people who are making that claim and right. yeah that's something that we can return to at some point okay well let's just try to you know for the sake of saving time just go through the next few slides the VAR system yeah this is another you know favorite thing of steve kirsch he says the deaths are grossly underestimated underreported that the VAERS is only like and he's he's using this one study from 2011 that said that only 1% of adverse events are reported in the VAR system. And he's extrapolating those minor adverse events like I don't know, headaches, inflammation, to deaths. So he's he's trying to like at least hint that if it's as high as 100%, the actual deaths could be not 500, well, not 5,000, but 500,000. And he's like, I guarantee you it's higher. And basically the response to this is the VAERS is not even confirmed deaths from vaccines. VAERS are suspected deaths that could be connected to vaccines. They're put in there exactly for the purposes to detect the earliest signal of danger so that the CDC can get on this as soon as possible. And they do investigate every report and try to confirm that, you know, confirm and deny. Did the vaccine cause it or is this just, you know, uh, uh, un unconnected events? Because when you vaccinate millions of people, obviously, a lot of people are just going to die who would have died normally because, you know, background mortality. And a lot of them would, would have been previously shortly vaccinated. And so people can start thinking that the vaccine caused it rather than it's just, you know, random mortality that is normally seen in, in the population. And I think a very good graph that demonstrates that it's not really the vaccines that are causing these, those deaths is this uh, overlaying of the vaccination rate to the VAERS deaths reported per month. And we have to remember that the first people who were vaccinated were the most vulnerable. The oldest people with the highest background mortality rate, they were vaccinated in as early as December and January and February. So obviously a lot of them would have died anyways and they died. And so they got put into the VAERS system for the people to later investigate was their death caused by vaccines. But we see that actually no, like there's no correlation between the increasing vaccination rate and the increase potential, there's no increase in various deaths. So you have like December minuscule vaccination rate, boom, you got in January, 1000 people in the, in the VAERS system potentially they dead from vaccine, but then vaccine gets, you know, the, the rate gets many, many times higher, but the VAERS reports do not, they don't grow and they actually start decreasing. Basically, this is very consistent with the population, with the you know vaccine population being opening up to younger and younger ages with younger, with lower and lower background mortality rates. And this is, I think, explains very well what you know the pattern that we've observed in virus is caused by. It's not caused by vaccines. It's just caused by the type of people who've been vaccinated and their background mortality rate. And cool. I mean, the, I, I could I could make a criticism of that by saying. No. The, the reason is that the authorities got so worried about the VAERS data that they started making it more difficult to report um, adverse events and that you can't trust the data because there's a huge pressure on doctors and on people not to report uh, adverse events. No, it's not difficult to report at all. Anybody can report it to the VAERS system. I actually, I mean, I, just for the interest of how to do it, I went to the website. It's very easy. It's three pages. You just have to put in a lot of details so that they can verify. I mean, what's your name? What's your doctor? When were you vaccinated? When? Uh, what's your address? What's your phone number? Uh, I mean, anybody can do it. And uh, you know, a lot of those reports, various reports are submitted by just regular people, relatives of people who passed away, who want to make sure that you know CDC actually investigates that their death wasn't caused by vaccines. So, and yeah, VAERS is a self-reporting system. Healthcare providers are required by law to submit reports if there's any kind of, not just death, but just any kind of adverse events. But at the same time, anybody can submit a report. Like if your relative died or you actually experienced some adverse event that you think is connected to the vaccine, you can submit a various report. And so, you know, they actually do investigate them. There was this case in 20, 2004, some guy submitted report that he got turned into a Hulk because of vaccines, CDC called him back make sure that he didn't get turned to, into Hulk. And you know that after that, they actually deleted his virus report because it was deemed to not have been caused by the, by the vaccine. So, I mean, no. And 
the fact that actually vaccines were pulled from the market because of very rare events like thrombosis should tell reasonable people that actually the system is working. They're looking at adverse events, very rare, very rare adverse events. And if those adverse events are real, potentially caused by vaccines, those vaccines will be pulled off the market, like AstraZeneca, right? Or myocarditis cases. I mean, how did they figure out that there's myocarditis cases? Because of the VAR system, all the reports putting people put in there, and then they investigated, saw that there was a difference between the background rate of uh, those myocarditis cases and the normal expected rate for that age demographic, and that's how they made the inference. Still, uh, the myocarditis cases, very, very rare. There's like just 300 cases out of millions of vaccinated 16 or not 16, 18 to 29 year olds. And, and I don't think anybody of them died. Like all of them recovered as, as far as I know, like maybe, yeah, I'm pretty sure all of them did. So again, it's, it's, it's an unfortunate event, very rare that thankfully got caught and in, in pales in comparison to the safety that vaccines provide from the huge, huge dangers, even from, for the same demographic from COVID. Like if you think young people are immune, to COVID uh, side effects or long-term COVID or even death, you you couldn't be more wrong because even in that age, COVID is very dangerous for those people, way, way more dangerous than any potential myocarditis rates from vaccines. All right, um, any, que any questions on the various system? No, you go for it, Yuri. All right, so the next uh, kind of bit of fair mongering actually comes from Brett himself. He thinks that since vaccine was observed to go into the bone marrow or go into the lymph nodes, that that somehow is a signal that we could be expecting cancers, either lymphomas or leukemia. Uh, and that has, again, no basis in, in fact whatsoever, because just theoretically, mRNA, mRNA in your cells, delivery of mRNA cannot in any way cause cancer, because cancer happens when there's a mutation in your DNA. DNA is in the nucleus. mRNA is delivered into the cytoplasm. mRNA does not get into the nucleus. It gets uh, translated on the ribosome outside, uh, outside of the nucleus. It gets translated into protein. So it cannot get into the nucleus to somehow create mutations in your nucleus. And this was actually the reason for the creation of mRNA platform, which I've kind of watched with great interest over the years because of my interest in Yamanaka factors. And this was the inspiration between at least the Moderna mRNA technology, where Derek Rossi started Moderna because initially he and Luigi Warren were investigating this very same platform for delivery of Yamanaka factors into cells. They didn't want to deliver DNA because DNA could integrate and you deliver oncogenes, who knows if they get into the cell, they can uh, cause uh, oncogenic transformation. Basically you wanna avoid that. But if you deliver mRNA, there's no chance of that happening. So that was the inspiration be behind the platform. And uh, to think that, oh, to think that somehow, you know, mRNA is going to the lymph nodes, which by the way, lymph nodes is where pretty much every vaccine goes because that's where, you know, the vaccine training uh, well, immune system training happens, to think that that somehow can then cause cancer is, again, absolutely unsubstantiated. Um, now we get to the claim that, oh my God, the vaccine does not stay in the injection site, which, again, only a person unfamiliar with drug development or, I don't know, biodistribution, even basic anatomy, could claim that we expect things that we inject in, in, in our shoulders to stay in the shoulders. No, actually, usually things, I mean, that's where things go all across the body when they get, get into the, the blood. And obviously the injection, intramuscular injection, decreases the amount of things that go into the blood. A lot of it does stay in the shoulder, but still a lot of it goes all around the body because some part of it gets into the bloodstream, some part of it gets into the lymphatic system. So it will get transported all over the body. And we've known before from any other pharmacokinetic studies of vaccines, vaccine adjuvants, whatever, that it goes into the other organs as well. So absolutely not surprising. It can only surprise people unfamiliar with drug development. Now we get to the teratogenic claim that we did make in the Quillette article and that Heather, for some reason, after she read the paper that we cite, she said that all oh, the authors find the opposite. And it's absolutely mind boggling because if you, if you read just the abstract, you will see that the paper does not find the, the opposite. 
it confirms that you know ivermectin is potentially teratogenic. It shows a 15% increased chance of stillbirth, 69% increased chance of congenital abnormalities. Although that's uh, you know low low statistical significance, it could be a signal. It might not be a signal, but still, like it's it's not. It has to be ruled out. It has to be ruled safe to claim it's not teratogenic, and and as it's it cannot be claimed safe it is assumed that it's dangerous to uh, pregnant people. And it's uh, then labeled in the FDA uh, and the, by manufacturer as to be contraindicated to pregnant people, to be avoided by, by women during pregnancy. So that's essentially what teratogenic means. And for, for having not to you know, see that from the paper is, is very, very odd. Also, we make a claim about the sperm toxicity observed in rats in many studies that uh, you know ivermectin is toxic to sperm and just to male reproductive uh, function in rats and uh, heather for some reason claims that when she read the cited paper she says that she saw that there are tiny effects maybe but it's in combination with this other drug verapamil verapamil only only then basically fertility negative effects become apparent but if you look at the paper that the article we cite provides, you very quickly will see that this is incorrect, that uh, just ivermectin alone does decrease the size of the testes, uh, decrease the actual size of the sex organs, and decreases the sperm count, like this is the sperm count on ivermectin, this is the sperm count on control. And yes, when ivermectin is used in conjunction with rapamil, it's a huge decrease. But even alone, ivermectin does produce toxicity to uh, rat reproductive, male reproductive function. And not just in that paper, there are other studies that uh, show this. It's potentially, not, it's, it's confirmed that there is reproductive toxicity to male fertility by ivermectin in, in rats, in animals. I'm not sure about like whether they did follow-up studies in actual humans, but in, in rats, we see the signal, and this is what we uh, link to in the Quillette article. So again, I'm just, I, I'm uh, flabbergasted that Heather would have a very different reading of the same numbers that, that we provide and the articles provide. All right, now we get back to this correlation is not causation thing with uh, uh, um, Heather citing the evidence that in Africa, as you mentioned, that you know in countries that have had ivermectin used as a prophylaxis against parasitic infections, that somehow they're showing like lower rates of infections of, of COVID. And again, I mean, she's just using correlation. Uh, it's not causation. It's not good evidence as Heather claims, I mean, correlation is never good evidence. It could be a, a kind of signal to assess whether it's causative evidence, but it's, by itself, it couldn't be used in any way as good evidence. And then when you actually examine the countries that they showcase as, as these uh, you know, places where ivermectin helped save the country from uh, outbreaks or decreased the numbers, you will see that they're actually mistaken. For example, on the actual podcast with Pierre Corey, he said that they basically eradicated COVID in Zimbabwe with widespread adoption of ivermectin. Well, first of all, actually, when you look at the graph of new infections in Zimbabwe, you will see that they nowhere near eradicated COVID. I mean, this dot is where the podcast happened. It was already the third wave was starting in Zimbabwe. And you know, in the next few days, it eclipsed anything previously seen in the other two waves. So basically, that claim is completely false. That ivermectin, like not just that ivermectin could be responsible for eradicating COVID, but basically that you know, anywhere near eradication of COVID to, to begin with. Secondly, also his claim that there was some kind of widespread adoption of ivermectin in Zimbabwe is false. This was pointed out, by the way, by these two other people on that better skeptics that I credited here. And uh, the, this person has done a calculation that showed that at most only 3% of people in Zimbabwe could have used ivermectin. And so like the claim of widespread adoption in Zimbabwe is factually incorrect. Finally, there's this claim by Brett that, not finally, but there's this on, finally on ivermectin, there's this claim by Brett that it somehow is immune to mutations, immune to like it's, it 
the escape variants cannot escape ivermectin. They can escape vaccines, bread things, but somehow ivermectin cannot be escaped by uh, these variants. And this is absolutely unsubstantiated based on nothing but conjecture. Like I haven't seen any data at all on ivermectin versus variants to be able to suggest that this is uh, any way close to the truth. And then we come to this claim of that we don't know what prophylaxis means that you mentioned in the beginning. That again, this is just, uh, I think, a problem of Heather's reading comprehension, or maybe both Brett's and Heather's reading comprehension, when they actually read what we wrote. Uh, you will clearly see that we first we talked about prophylaxis, then we say that we don't yet know that the drug provides any significant benefit, which means any significant benefit either for prophylaxis or treatment. Then we go with the next, we substantiate the claim for treatment. We go when the studies are done properly, this treatment study with patients with mild COVID, which obviously, you know, it's uh, clear to anybody that you know, reads it that we're talking about uh, treatment. Patients with mild COVID, already it's treatment, can be construed to be anything related to prophylaxis. So we show that a properly done study, the effect evaporates. And then again, we just go to the next paragraph and talk about the actual prophylaxis, that even if we give ivermectin the benefit of the doubt that it's 85% effective, as claimed by you know the meta analysis on IVM meta, the, whatever the website, it is still three times worse than the protections that vaccines provide. So, like there's zero basis to suggest that ivermectin should be used over vaccines because vaccines provide a you know much better level of protection with just two shots versus ivermectin, which you have to take continuously and I'm not even sure like weekly regimen or or somewhere more frequent regimen. Um, and, you know, the two other claims, they just uh, very odd claims that Brett made that, you know, for some reason, if he thinks because ivermectin comes from soil bacteria, somehow it could have been seen by our ancestors. And somehow that means we should have, I don't know what, a reasonably elegant way of dealing with it than some, something that, uh, I don't know what he means, synthetic molecule. But of course, there's plenty of other things that come from the soil that are highly toxic and just because something you know he thinks is natural does not offer it any 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 advantage to whatever you know uh, synthetic drug developed against a particular target or a known target so we have anthrax both botox and tetanus be causing bacteria all come from soil bacteria and uh, i mean they're obviously not something that you want to put in your body all right i think uh, that pretty much concludes the slide deck <laughs> Sorry, it took a long, longer time than I anticipated, but uh, hopefully, you know, for people who were asking to, to walk through all these claims, uh, I think it could be helpful. That, so I think, you know, time might be worth it. Yeah, and as I said at the beginning, and um, we'll repeat now, this is, I'm, I'm doing this interview with you because I think what you have to say makes sense to me. I think these topics are so important that we need to be really clear that we are trying to overcome the, the fragmentation of the information landscape and where people are stuck in echo chambers, where people are only hearing stuff that they agree with. And if you disagreed with all of this and you're watching to the end, I want to say, well done. Thank you uh, for, for sticking all the way through. Um, we're going to continue to, to cover this. We're going to look at it in, yeah, we're going we're gonna to continue to look at all sides of it. And I wanted to ask you, Yuri, if you've got any kind of summary that you think people should take away in terms of who they trust and where they trust and why, um, yeah, what, what you think people should be doing to understand this better. I think I've said it several times, you know, don't trust people, trust the data. Try to look at, you know, each argument that you think is weak. Try to look at the data I provide and, you know, make your own call on whether you think it's valid or not. Or conversely, if you think, you know, there's an argument of Brett's that you think is strong, try to actually confirm that the data supports it and, you know, make the decision on, based on that. And what's your, what's your sense about people's capacity to make these decisions? Well, I mean, obviously it varies. Uh, some people are smarter, some people are dumber, some people are better at data analysis, some people are worse. So uh, it's hard, but uh, I mean, the, the, the basic principle is still the same, whether you actually can do it or not is, 
is irrelevant, but this is definitely something they should strive to do rather than just blindly trust your favorite YouTuber. Awesome. Yuri, thank you for walking us through that, taking the time, and I'm sure we'll see you again soon. Yay, it's my pleasure, thanks. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. And if you'd like to join conversations like this, check out a digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films, you can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions, and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes, and you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below, and we'd love to see you soon.